You are listening to the EdTech Takeout from Grantwood AEA, an educational service agency that supports school districts in eastern Iowa with a focus on equity, excellence, and efficiency in education for all children. Welcome to episode 33 of the EdTech Takeout, the podcast that serves up bite-sized technology tips for teachers. My name's Jonathan Wiley, and I am joined by Mindy Carney. Hello. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Pretty good. I feel like right. we're back in the recording studio a little sooner Spending than normal. Spending a lot of time together. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of like a bonus episode, yeah. maybe. Yeah. When we were at uh, the iTech conference, um, it was going to be last month now, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we are at iTech last month. We wanted to take the opportunity to try and uh, talk to one of our AEA colleagues and uh, we thought it was a good opportunity, since we were all in the same place at the same time, that we could catch up together. Yeah, so we talked to uh, Jared Borman, and um, he has been talking a lot about professional learning and professional development. And we just kind of sat him down and talked a little bit about his thoughts. Yeah, Jared does kind of what we do, but in a different part of the state. So, um, you know, he does professional development with teachers like like we do as well and uh, he's been reassessing what that looks like and trying to build new models around that so maybe we should just cut straight to the chase yeah, let's do it all right All right, so coming up next, the main course, Serve to You Piping Hot, we're going to be talking about professional development with Jared Borman. Welcome, Jared, special guest today. Thanks for having me. A huge fan of the podcast, by the way, oh, so well, I'm honored to be on it. We pay we pay our guests to say that, and we appreciate that. <laughs> so, um, Jared, do you want to explain to people maybe who you are, what you do, tell them a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, so, Jared Borman, my current role is I'm at the Keystone AEA up in the northeast corner of the state as an instructional technology specialist. But um, I also do a little adjunct professorship. I uh, um, also do some writing and all that other stuff. So, But a lot of it's around my passion or, of professional development and re-empowering educators is what it really boils down to. So professional development, it's something that the three of us are all you know, tasked with doing as, as part of our day-to-day -day jobs. Um, what kind of... Th Trends or ideas are you are you seeing with professional development that uh, sparked your interest here? Well, it wasn't necessarily the trends that sparked my interest. I guess as a as a teacher, I just in a matter of seven eight years, and as a classroom teacher, I was experiencing professional development in a very passive learning style, and it was a one size fits all model and all of that. And so I kind of thought, well, is this just you know my learning environment, my PD structure? Is that how it is? And then. Um, once I got my master's in instructional technology in 2014, I got in with the AEA and uh, worked with more schools and realized that this is this is way more than just one school district. There's a lot. And so the more I connect on Twitter and Voxer and I'm talking with other educators, uh, administrators and teachers and coaches, and they say, yes, we're in our state and here and there. So this isn't just, uh, you know, the traditional style of professional development isn't just in one particular area, it really is all over. And, um, so then I started to dig more into this a little bit. And there's, I mean, there's one particular school district that I work with where the story kicks off with, but the more I dug into it, you hear these other kind of trends with professional development. And so we were talking about, um, you know, gamifying PD and things of that nature and books out there that come up with all these different strategies to make PD more fun and everything. But, uh, when you kind of boil down, to what it really is trying to do. It's just trying to still make the same kind of compliance style PD just more fun, I think. Yeah. Right. And so um, I, I kind of thought to myself, this this still doesn't feel like learning mm -hmm. as an adult. It still feels like I'm just getting information. I'm just getting it differently. So it really started with one school district and the big question that the superintendent asked, I had the opportunity to be sitting at the table with the PD planning team, I was kind of filling in and helping fill in that role for the planning team. And, um, they had, they were just going one to one with some laptops, a pretty hefty initiative. 
And so we were coming up with ideas like they're, they're going to need some Google training. They're going to need this. They're going to need that. And pretty soon the superintendent just said, okay, guys, this is all it looks great. Okay, I get it. But what about the teachers that don't need any of that stuff? Yeah. And that was the question where it was like the aha moment for me where I began to think we really need to think of our model of learning for all adult learners, not just – the ones who need it the most are the ones who are already higher flyers, but everyone. So yeah. working those pieces in. And there's a, like a sense of irony here I, I see because like, you know, for the last few years, like teachers are getting lots of PD on how to deliver content to students and how to make it interactive, how to involve all learners, how to personalize learning and do all that kind of stuff. But we have not spent as much time on the teachers, <laughs> yeah. professional development for teachers themselves. That is exactly right. And um, here at iTech, we had the opportunity to listen to some two really good keynote speakers who talked about what we need to do for kids. And you you see those messages all the time. But I'm saying, I, in, my, in my opinion, I say, yes, we need to focus on the kids. But we can't make the impact and change that we want to see happen with that positive effect on learner outcomes if we don't focus on our own learning as well. And how is that effectively done most within a school district? I'm, and I'm not talking about just the best teachers who already go out and do their own learning. I'm, I'm talking every adult learner in your building, all of them need to be honored as a professional learner. And so building that time in that personalized PD time in the contract hours is where we see the biggest gains and the biggest dividends. Well, and that's so that kind of leads me, I guess, to the next question is, so how, what does that look like in a school district or how do you roll that out or how, um, I, I think sometimes, um, as someone who offers professional development, how do you get that conversation with, um, started with administrators when you want to just say, I'm not sure this is right for everybody. I mean, what are your talking points or any of those? I answer, I asked like seven questions. There, you did. Jared, yeah. And I'd like I'm, specific I'm, answers for I'm all of them. Figure out, ooh, <laughs> can I get that all in one breath? So, yeah, um, let me, so let me start again, I guess. So what are your talking points when you're kind of, are, are you waiting for the administrator first to have an aha moment themselves or mm. how do you kind of, you know, what do you do yeah. in there? So I kind of alluded to it, I think, already, where was, I, I always wait for a school district to self-admittedly say at a table out loud at some point, our PD is not serving everyone right now or something to that effect. Once I hear that, then I say they have identified what's not working. And then I can bring to them what could work better, the, the professionally driven model for personalized PD. And so... Then the conversation turns to, well, why personalized PD versus what we've been doing? Um, and really, and, and I'm glad you asked the question about talking points. Really, I kind of center it around what I call the big three to, P, to be PD. And that is we want to focus on three big ideas of developing a growth mindset for educators because traditional forms of professional development really do a very good job of conditioning teachers into a fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to focus on what does that process exactly mean as an adult learner? And then also intrinsic motivation. I, I understand, you know, there are some great benefits like chemicals in the brain to gamification and everything like that. But really when I see game, when, when I go to conferences and I see sessions that, that promote gamification with PD, really, um, I'm seeing a, a very massive extrinsic motivation system. And that's how it's usually treated. That's not sustainable. It lasts maybe a few years at most, and then it slowly starts to die off as soon as all the, the carrots, as you sort of say, like the carrot or the stick, the carrots start to run out, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that so intrinsic motivation. We have to have a system based on intrinsic motivation. And then the third piece is sustainable autonomy. I've talked to some school districts, and they say, oh, we did an ed camp as a district last month. It was awesome. And I say, okay, are you doing something like that again this month? No. Right. <laughs> it's one and done. That's, yeah. that's not sustainable. We right. need something. And when I say sustainable, I, I'm talking like something from the day you start teaching to the day you retire. That is the model that we need year after year after year after year. Um, and that's honestly the biggest part in, in coming up with, uh, the language and the verbiage for that in that talking points with, with administrators mm -hmm. and teachers. Uh, that was probably the part that I lost the most sleep at, of, at night just because I thought I do not want a model of learning to fall into the three-year cycle 
with everything else that happens in education. Mm -hmm. So those are the three big pieces, growth mindset, intrinsic motivation, and sustainable autonomy that this model is built on and what really drives it and where we see the biggest gains in our adult learners. Yeah, so it's guarding against that one more thing type of yes. analogy where yep. you know schools have that initiative fatigue and so that's got to be a, a hard battle to come over um it is yeah so so what what's what's the origin story here what where where did you first uh, start this uh, professionally driven model uh, what school were you working at and how did that all work it, out it started at old wine my first year um i uh was held, kind of sub filling in a little bit as like a tech coordinator kind of role somewhat. Um, and so we started this model and it, it, there were so many positive stories that came from it. And then, um, from there it was like another school was asking about it and then another school and another school. And then, um, they asked me to present it at a high tech the last couple of years and then the Iowa one to one conference. And then, I had the opportunity to speak at ISTE a couple of years ago in Denver. So, um, it, it the, so far it's been spreading word of mouth yeah. essentially. Um, and then just recently I put together a website. Actually, I went to my, <laughs> I went to my, uh, college professor through grad school and I said, look, I get the same 15 or 20 questions from school districts about this model. Like I can almost guarantee what questions are going to be asked and I, and I have the answer for it. And he said, honestly, it sounds like you need a book. And I was like, whoa, that, I was not expecting that. Right. Um, that means I actually have to write one. He's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that's how the book idea came about. And I had a few, I was lucky enough to have a few other colleagues and friends be like, yes, you, you should. And then even some people inside the school districts that were doing this model, were like, yes, other schools need this message. So, um, that's how the idea of a whole, of, of a book came about. Uh, but yeah, it all started with one school district and a superintendent really who was think who who asked that question was just what about all learners, all adult learners? What about us? And mm-hmm. that's how the and at the table at that moment it was like I the other more talking happened, but I basically turned the agenda over and I just started plotting stuff out. I was like, if we could start from scratch, what would that look like? And I started to plot stuff on paper and I said, Okay, what about this? And so I would pitch it. And then more questions would pop up from the group. And then I would sit here and kind of tweak some things or we tweak some things together a little bit and say, what about this and this aspect? And so even the model in that first year doesn't look like the model that I kind of put out there now to other schools. Mm-hmm. Like there were still some aspects of it that was more focused on technology versus pedagogy. And that has really helped make this a flexible model for any school size. I mean, from a big school district like Dallas Center Grimes to a very, very small school district. I have a, a, a tiny, small school district, a parochial school that's implementing it. Um, so it's flexible mm-hmm. no matter what because it's adult learning and it's just a learning environment that happens every year. Yeah, and it makes sense that the the program itself is adaptable and flexible and scalable because that's what you're looking for in terms of the, the professional development you're right. delivering for teachers to yep. be the same way. So I have a question about that. Um, how is, so um, we don't want it to be one more thing, obviously. Is there any discussion ever around um, teachers setting goals that are still keeping in mind of their district initiatives? And yes. Areas? So what's the conversation around that? I'm curious. So I get that question a lot. And really when I sit down with the district le- leadership team or admin or coaches or whomever, whoever whoever's wanting to be around the table, honestly, um, when I, when we look at that question, what we try to do is we try to parse this out and say, okay, I'm a realist. I understand that in your prof- uh, contractual professional development time, you're going to have the things that are the have tos. I understand that those mm-hmm. are not going to go away. But what we're trying to do is basically take an audit of the current PD time and say, is, is there time in our PD structure that is just a time sucker? Like just mm, sure. really sucking the time out. Mm-hmm. If that's the case, then can we build that time in per month for the professionally driven model? Mm -hmm. And that's where we have that conversation to be able to allocate that time, promise it to educators and say, this is your time to be sustainably autonomous. And we promise not to cut into that time. I always say to administrative team, if you're going to promise them three hours per month, because you then have that time, you have to protect <laughs> yeah, it. Right. You Absolutely. cannot cut into that yeah. with staff meetings or anything else because you will start to lose that trust mm-hmm. once again. 
So that's really important about it. And um, as far as building in the, the district leadership, or sorry, the district goals or um, initiives or the, what, how'd you put it, goals, plans? I'm sure it was very eloquent. It was very um, let eloquent. Let me think back. I think I said district, just district initiatives. District initiatives yeah. yeah. So if, like with the district initiatives, those can still remain over here as the have tos. Mm-hmm. Okay. We right. can, we, there's still that have to time. If there is a have to, let's say I have one school district that um, is really trying to go like standards-based education as a district. And there are some teachers that have become really invested in this. And some have said, well, I have to do this. Can I just do it for personalized PD time? Well, is it a thing you, is it something that intrinsically motivates you? Well, no. I was like, then, then keep that over here for the have to time Mm -hmm. and let's see what we can do for the want to time. Mm -hmm. But then there are some teachers say, I'm really interested in this because I'm interested in trying to see what are the best assessment strategies within this standards-based education environment that we're trying to create that promotes, say, a growth mindset for my students. Now we got a big question that we can tackle for your professionally driven journey. Right. So it, it's it, you just got to hear people. Like I don't ever have like a right answer. Mm-hmm. I would say, well, there's like, when you ask me a question, there's 50 more questions I want to ask that person before I can really help them in some fashion. Sure. So I'm wondering, too, what kind of um, supports then do schools or are they building into something like this as far as um, I'm just thinking about a teacher like taking on this learning goal and what kind of support is there for a teacher who's doing something like that? Does this work really well to begin with with like people that have coaches or instructional coaches or I mean, what's the role that they might have in something that like this? That is a very good question. In fact, you know, it kind of goes back to Gusky's work of and this was in 1986 of like, why do we even do professional development? And so what he found was usually we try to go through these four phases, but he found that a very, 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 very small percentage of educators actually go through those four phases. But when you add the coaching piece to it, the percentage goes up. Mm -hmm. So this model of of, uh, personalized PD really is more effective when you have coaches in place, in-house coaches. And I realize some may not, but in the state of Iowa, we're fortunate that a lot of schools have those coaches in place. But I've worked with school districts that before in the state of Iowa that came out with the whole teacher leadership grant stuff, um, they didn't have those coaches in place. So, But I was still working with them on, okay, if this is the coaching role, how can we maybe divvy up those different responsibilities of the coaching role between some teacher leaders or some uh, administrators and so on and so AEA forth. AEA consultants. AEA cons- absolutely, <laughs> bringing in AEA consultants. Like That's honestly what I c- did quite a bit with those yeah. particular schools. Um, but really the support piece is this with the four phases from research to integration, to reflection, to sharing, when you have someone who feels that they're ready to go from one phase to the next, all we ask them to do is simply have a conversation with your coach. We're not going to ask you to type out answers. We're not going to ask you to fill out this sheet of paper. It's here are the list of coaching questions that could guide a nice coaching conversation in this particular transition from this phase to the next. Mm-hmm. And the reason why you want that conversation coach or that coaching conversation to happen is so your coach can ask the questions that would help me to reflect deeper than what I normally would. Mm-hmm. Are they helping me see this journey in a different aspect that I wouldn't have before? Sure. And so, some people may say that as the quote unquote, and I use quotes because I don't like the word accountability, but the accountability piece, maybe, but it, let's say, you know, Mindy, if you can't, if I was your coach and I checked in with you and I was like, how are things going? Um, and you're like, I'm ready for the integration phase. Like, oh, can we have a conversation? Like, no, I think I got it. I mean, just back off, man. Uh, I, yeah. You're like, just back <laughs> off. I'm going to be like, no, yeah. you can't go to the integration phase unless you have a conversation with me. There's no, there's none of that. There's not, that's not the big brother system. Mm-hmm. We're professional adult learners. We need to be treated like professional adult learners. Yeah, right. I might be able to foresee based on some of the research that you were doing that if you jump into the integration phase without thinking about, well, what is it that you're exactly going to kind of be looking for that tells you it's working? Mm-hmm. If you can't articulate that, I got a strong feeling you're going to end up back at research. Right. But, but you, you have to go through that process exactly. yourself, right? You will discover sure. that for yourself. I'm not going to necessarily say, well, good luck. I'll see yeah. you back at the research phase. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. So on our, on our last podcast, I was talking to Mindy a little bit about, uh, 
the gamification and mm-hmm. the badging and all that kind of stuff. And I admitted that I'm I'm one of these people that needs a little bit more persuasion uh, on that <laughs> side of things than some other people yeah. to get on that boat. So I mean, what is the, the badging and the gamification side of the, the professional driven model look like? So that's the, that's, I don't want, well, so I call them recognition pieces okay. for, for a couple of reasons. Um, I don't use the word rewards or awards because usually those imply that there is a path laid out for me. And once I have completed that predetermined path, I receive something for it. Yeah. Whereas this is you're determining the path. I have no clue what your path is going to look like. I'm as your coach, I'm just here like walking next to you saying, Hey, you need me. I'm Mm -hmm. right here. I'm not pushing you up the mountain. I'm not pulling you up the mountain. I'm walking every step with you. Right. So the idea is that in the process, and I was thinking back to like my, my experience of trying to go through the flip learning process of changing my learning environment from my classroom and make it more flipped. That was a year and a half before I really felt like I had it down and, and correctly. And so with recognition pieces, they kind of help, um, identify where I am on my journey. If we're only giving three hours per month to educators, which really is on the lower end of where we kind of start with a lot of the professionally driven models in school districts. But if I don't get to that journey again till the next month, it's, I could feel like I'm spinning my wheels for a year and a half, especially that integration phase where it's like trial and error, like failing forward all the Mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Um, so the recognition piece, and not only that, the recognition piece ties in what I, I highly recommend a school district does, and they, they should use an analogy. Don't take the professionally driven model and say, this is Jared's thing and we're just going to do this. Take the structure that's there. Let's, let's restructure how we look at PD and now let's make it ours. And so I always, always recommend to a school district, is there an analogy that is like based on your mascot or your school or your community even that we could incorporate with these phases so that way we don't necessarily call them research, integration, reflect, and share, but four phases that go along with your analogy. So just case in point, there's a school district uh, that I work with that they were trying to do something with their mascot, the Warriors, and it just wasn't really clicking. But there's also a river that runs through town. So like, oh, maybe we do something with like bodies of water from a creek to a river to a whatever, you know? Yeah. And it worked. But it, you could tell at the table, it just didn't resonate with people. They're like, I don't, you know, they didn't, there was, eh. Well, then someone came up with the idea of like, well, what about the bridge? Cause they have a historic limestone bridge, arch bridge that mm-hmm. spans over it. And they said, well, is there something we can do with that? And so we started talking about the process of building a bridge is very similar to the process of what we're doing with this professionally driven model. Those four phases matched up very nicely. And the part that resonated with them was it's kind of like when we are looking to see what's not working in our classroom where we're seeing a gap, you're trying to build a bridge. I was like, that is perfect. Yeah. Right. It resonates with people. Mm -hmm. It got them to own it. And that was the important piece. And so what they're doing with each phase is when I go from one phase to the next, I receive my recognition piece. And they use eight inch round magnets that indicate, so they can put it on their whiteboards in their classroom or put it on display if they want to. Which is a lot like a badge. I understand it's like a badge, but here's where it's different. (laughs) Here's where it's different. Okay. So here's where it's different. So when I reach the next phase, I turn in my previous recognition piece and I receive the next one. And so that process continues until I reach that last phase. And once I've actually shared outside my district, which is the last phase, then I received the last recognition piece and their recognition piece is a, is a substantial piece of limestone with their school logo on it and the keystone bridge and personalized PD on it. Mm-hmm. And once you've completed it, everybody's like, so are we done? And it's like, what's your next journey? Yeah. So the analogy that I use in my book is it's like climbing a mountain, but I'm not asking you to climb 25 different mountains. It's one mountain. Point B is positive effects on learner outcomes. That mountain can be climbed an infinite number of ways in so many different directions every single time over the entire course of your teaching career. So if I'm in that school district of building a bridge and I continue my journeys and I get another one and another one over the course of my entire teaching career, each journey, I get a notch on the back of my piece of limestone that indicates how many journeys I've completed. So I have a physical representation of all the learning I did as an adult learner, which I know some people be like, 
that's badging. But I've heard that <laughs> I've heard the definition of badging used multiple different ways too. Sure. So. sure. Yeah. So I mean, but the other way I I see the difference from how we normally maybe talk about badging is that I think badging is usually a often applied to maybe not usually but often applied to i have done these 10 skills i get a badge i do 10 more skills i get a badge and what you're talking about is a much more personalized learning path where Mm -hmm. people are doing i do what i think is going to best improve me as an educator it's not as competitive as maybe right it's just the competitive nature out of yeah there's there's no leader tables there's no high scores there's no oh i'm gonna do more to beat this person but it's you know, yeah, your like your journey like that. that. Yeah. Your journey. <laughs> so in this case, your journey would be different than your journey. And I was in a oh, school district yes. like months ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a school district months ago, and one teacher came up to me and he said, "Hey, I have my recognition piece hanging in my classroom." And I had some students asking me, like, "Oh, what's that all about?" And he said, yeah. "Well, I'm learning. I'm here's what I'm doing for my." learning journey and here's how we keep learning even as teachers and it created created a great conversation with the student but then one student said yeah but so and so is at the next level Mm -hmm. and the teacher had the best answer he goes that may be so but their journey is totally different than mine Mm -hmm. like we're not even Mm -hmm. on the same journey so good for them that's awesome Mm -hmm. because in my journey this is where i am so because you're not on the same journey and i know it sounds like everybody's just individually doing their own thing but let's say all three of us on kickoff day have developed similar questions, we can now form a natural collaborative group Mm -hmm. versus being in great content like or anything like that. You know, so Mm -hmm. it's naturally organically formed and we are intrinsically motivated to tackle the same thing, even though you might be in an elementary classroom Mm -hmm. and I might be in a high school classroom, which those, those pairings really don't happen too often. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's the other cool part about it. And I don't want people to get the wrong impression that it's everybody doing their own thing. It's where collaboration naturally happens. Make it happen. So in terms of like resources to support teachers in in that journey, is that something that the teachers are tasked with finding themselves or are the administrators help with that? Or, you know, where does that come from? Does it come from external learning opportunities like conferences or different places? There's a difference between the thing that I say in the book is buying and shopping. Usually when you shop, you go to a mall, you, you have an idea kind of of what you're thinking. But really, you're probably going to walk out of the mall with more stuff than what you anticipated <laughs> getting. Yeah. But Amazon, I know what I need when I go to Amazon. That's buying. So really what I'm trying to promote is the idea of having a, all educators have that instructional goal before they go to a conference. Like, you know, like the iTech here. You might have some people here that are shopping, just going through some sessions, feeling out what's kind of cool and all that other stuff. And they might take something back that they weren't anticipating, you know. Uh, they might have found that good sale, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. But if they came here with a pedagogical instructional purpose and say, this is what I need to know more about for this pedagogical reason, now they're buying, whether they go to that ed camp or that conference or they read that book or watch that video. And so this is where I've done whole staff trainings and sessions on why building a professional learning network is so important and get them started on Twitter and get them started with Twitter accounts and then have none of them ever change their picture away from an egg and stuff like that. You know, (laughs) although that's done away now, it's like little silhouettes. But the idea is that if you're, if you're an educator and you're like, Oh boy, I really need to move my learners from lower level thinking to upper level thinking in this particular aspect of my classroom, but I have no idea how I come from an English background. You might be a math teacher, but the thing is, I know, I have no clue how to help you, but I know a huge community of math teachers and some hashtags. Why don't we go search on Twitter? And now I have given them a pedagogical reason to join Twitter Mm -hmm. and build that PLN. Mm -hmm. And even Facebook groups. Facebook is really starting to become popular with teacher groups now, too, more so Mm -hmm. than what it was before, it seems. Mm -hmm. More of that in my Facebook feed than of cats. Yeah, exactly, which is probably a good thing, right? Yes. (laughs) The dog lover. (laughs) All right, so I'm going to try and wrap this up a little bit. Um, Where can people find out more about uh, the professionally driven model, your website, your book, more about you if they have questions, they want to follow up or get in touch with what's what's going on here? Well, I'm on Twitter. I love using Twitter to connect with people. Um, I'm at Jay Borman, which is J-B-O-R-M-A-N-N, and then the number three. Um, otherwise, if you go to professionallydriven.com, I have 
free printables. I have free videos. I have free resources there. Uh, my book is now on pre-order currently, so they can pre-order the book there if they want to know more. And I'm really proud of the book because um, the first draft was not good. <laughs> it was like a how-to book with the why sprinkled throughout. And yeah. so after going back through the first draft and saying, I really need to pull out the whys and expand those. And so the book has got a solid base of why, some of those talking points, as you were mentioning before, mm -hmm. uh, about what kind of talking points can we have, and then moving into the how. So there's like a whole chapter of just the how, and then a whole chapter for the coaches as well. So the coaches, if you're an instructional coach and you're wondering, well, how do I support this? Where do I fit into all of this? There is a whole chapter just for you. So Nice. Yeah, you and I were talking about the book last night, and you said it took you like a year and a half from start yeah. to finish. So yeah. this is like a, a real labor of life. Love it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it truly is. A, it's a, it's a, it really is a passion of mine simply because when I was in the classroom, I, I was actually very, very scared to leave the classroom simply because I absolutely loved my job. I loved seeing the aha moments and everything. And I felt that if I didn't gain that same sense of satisfaction in my new role at the AEA, I was going to go right back to the classroom. Yeah. But I was fortunate enough in that first year to be able to help one school district with this. And when we started doing that, you started seeing all kinds of light bulb aha moments with adult learners. And honestly, that has been just as gratifying for me. If I can see a teacher of 20 plus years self-discover what it is that they want to do better in their classroom and drive that and go go to town with it, that is so rewarding to me. So I, uh, I, I just appreciate hearing those stories of people that implement the model and they, they reach back out to me and they say, this is what we've seen. And then the, even the individual stories, I'm like, that's, that's so amazing. So that's always fun to hear. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good for you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I so appreciate this. It's a lot of fun to finally be on the ed tech takeout. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jared. Yeah. Thank you. Right, so on to my favorite part of the show. Up next is Tech Nuggets. How about I go first today? Sounds good to me. Yeah. So um, my first nugget is um, actually a digital citizenship nugget. So uh, Google has their own little digital citizenship program, and it's called Be Internet Awesome. And... Um, it actually has a couple different features. So there is a game that's built in to be Internet Awesome, um, and it's called Interland. And I would say it's probably for younger students. Um, I don't know, first grade through, I don't know, sixth grade might be a push, but fifth grade, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a video game where students can go through and uh, play the game and think a little bit about digital citizenship. That part is all well and good, uh, but I think the real power is in the resources in, in Be Internet Awesome. There's um, some different lesson plans uh, that you can walk through, different activities, and not just like the activities where you stand in front of the room and tell the students to not share their information with strangers online, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we hear a lot of that. Right. So um, but actually, I think activities that are kind of engaging and, and make students think. So um, that's definitely a place to look as you're I don't know. I, I I like to think that digital citizenship is being taught consistently throughout the school year and being brought up over and over and over again in authentic ways. But if you're looking for a place to start or maybe looking for something different to kind of shake it up, I think it's a good place to to look. Yeah, I like it. It's always good to have more resources on that digital citizenship front. It seems like you can never have enough. Right. Mix and match. Mix and match. Okay, so I'm looking at my next pick. Actually, I'm looking at all the picks we have for Tech Nuggets here, and I see a bit of a Google theme I, I didn't see before. But uh, So mine is a Chrome extension called Checkmark, okay. which I just came across recently. It's by EdTech Team who you may have seen mm -hmm. at uh, various conferences and Google Summit type things. They do lots of Google stuff. Um, it's mainly for like checking student grammar and content and giving feedback quickly and easily inside of Google Docs. So you install the checkmark extension, and then you would highlight a part of the text that you wanted to um, 
give some feedback on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the check mark thing will automatically pop up with pre filled phrases that you can choose from. So um, I'm looking at the demo here now. And mm -hmm. if, if you click on like um, one, it will say, evidence needed or subject verb agreement or more detail required and things like that. And it pops them up as comments in the sidebar. So it's just like a quick way you can choose from some grading comment and feedback. And I know there's other tools like that out there, but this is kind of a new one, I think. I thought it might be worth bringing to people's attention. Um, I think when I, when I look at it and I've played with it a little bit, the... I would like to be able to customize maybe some of the comments or like add some more information to some of the comments yeah. because some of them just say like check punctuation or yeah. subject verb agreement, right. which is okay. I mean, if you just want to quickly run through like a first draft of student mm -hmm. work or something, but it's not necessarily all that personal, but yeah. maybe it's built for speed more than anything else. Well, in our last episode too, um, Stacy had brought up about using Google Keep to, so maybe if you're looking for some more in-depth ones, mm -hmm. like you said, this would be a good surface one for a first run through, but then pulling in Google Keep after that, if you need some more personalized feedback, yep. you might make a good team. There you go. Providing all that feedback is a lot of work. Yes, it is. Yeah. Right. So it's a free extension. Good one. It's called Checkmark. All right. So, yeah, I guess my other my other uh, tech nugget is an oldie but a goodie, and I don't think one that we've brought up on the podcast before, and it is um, a Google Sheet add-on called Autocrat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not the biggest user of Google Sheets, but go on. Yeah, so um, I actually brought this one up because I was just using Autocrat, oh, like a week or two ago, and I thought, oh, I should bring this one up. This is a good one. The way that I was using Autocrat is um, I had a principal who wanted to create a walkthrough form using Google Forms. And um, so we created the form. And then the way it works, of course, is that Google Form brings all that data into a Google Sheet. And Autocrat then will take the information from the Google Sheet and you tell it what information that you want it to use. And it will send out... Um, we used it for a Google Doc that was emailed then um, to the teacher. So it got the teacher received all of that feedback instant. Well, not instantaneously it has to run. Mm -hmm. It takes 30 seconds for it to want to run or whatever. Yeah. So pretty close. Um, but then the teacher received that instant walkthrough feedback from the principal. Yes. Yes. It, it's good. It's not for like. <laughs> it's not for beginners. the faint of heart. No. Yeah. No, it takes it's a little. If you'd never really mess with spreadsheets and things and add-ons for spreadsheets before, right. then, you know, we could maybe include, there's lots of like YouTube videos sure. and things. For, Our own Jason Marshall has an autocrat. He video. does. He does. I yeah. can add that in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Put that in the show notes. But it's kind of a nice one um, because, especially if you're doing like individualized reports, but you want to use a kind of a standard um, form. It's kind of nice to be able to push all that information out without like sharing the sheet and having everybody see everybody's information. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So lots of good uses, but uh, that's a, that's a good one for sure. Yeah, it is. Okay, I'm also digging into the archives of retro tech here. Um, <laughs> retro tech, I love that. <laughs> yeah, this is one that maybe uh, a lot of people have heard of before, and I, mean, I knew about it before, but it's just something I haven't been on my radar recently until I saw a blog post by Jake Miller, who's someone I follow on Twitter. He is uh, at Jake Miller Tech. And uh, he wrote a blog post on Boomerang for Gmail, which is... Uh, an extension you can have um, for your browser. And he came up with three three ways he uses Boomerang, and I thought, huh, that's kind of, yeah, that's cool. I could see myself using those. So the first one was um, it's the send later function, and that's something I think would be awesome to have inside of Gmail where you can compose an email and then just wait until it goes out like tomorrow or sometime later in the week. Um, I know I've sent emails to people and they've written back and said, you were doing email at 1030 at yes. night, what's going on here? And I'm I like, I believe oh. you and I have had that email chain before too. Yeah, so um, that would be a, a way I could make it look like I was just working at 8 o'clock like in the morning. Like a normal human being. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so send later. Well, the nice thing about it though, I think too, is that a lot of times we are so like caught up in our email that you sent me an email at 1030 and 
I'm going to respond at 1032. So it's yeah. kind of a nice way of being like, I don't expect a response until tomorrow morning. It's but you want to get it off your plate. It's bad habits, isn't yes, it? Yes, it yeah. is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the second use he had, obviously, was like the boomerang feature, which is what it was kind of built for, where maybe I get an email from Mindy and I'm like, yeah, I can't deal with this right now. <laughs> Let's boomerang it for until tomorrow. Right. And then the email will go away out of my inbox. So it's not like <gasps> nagging Shut at me. The front door. It yeah. goes away and comes yeah. back. And then it comes back tomorrow. Oh, that's why it's called boomerang. And then I get it tomorrow and I delete it and uh, <laughs> without doing anything else with it. Right. And so the third one is uh, boomerang if no response, which is kind of cool. Like if I send an email to Mindy and she doesn't reply within a day or so, I can have it come back and say, hey, Mindy's not um, replied yet. So um, you might want to follow up with her. Hmm. So that could be a good one, too, if you're emailing out people and you're like, oh, because you, you just forget. You send and forget and you yeah, move right. on and do something else. But then this will say, hey, if you've had no replies within a certain amount of time, it will boomerang the email back to you, and uh, mm. you can follow up again and say, hey, did you get my email? Oh, that's interesting. And see where that goes. I like that. So there you go. Boomerang for Gmail. Good. Okay. Have we done all the tech nuggets? <laughs> that was all the tech oh, nuggets. That was all the tech nuggets. Okay. <laughs> well, that takes us on to uh, podcast picks, which we've not done for a while. Right. Uh, we did actually have uh, one of our listeners, uh, Arcadia, who is at Tech with Parson on Twitter, who was uh, listening to some of our back episodes and was hoping we'd give some more uh, podcast recommendations. So I know Mindy always loves these. <laughs> I'm not a huge podcast listener. Okay. Listen to country more, music. More of a podcast producer. Uh, yeah, yeah. I know, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So I got a couple here and then I'll give you another uh, resource maybe that might be worth checking yeah, out right. um so one is called the cult of pedagogy podcast and that might be something that a lot of you are familiar with already jennifer gonzalez has this blog that she writes called cult of com. she always has a lot of great stuff um so she started to podcast some of her blog posts which i think is an interesting idea mm -hmm. so the podcast that you listen to is basically a lot of the time she'll just read word for word through a blog post and maybe she writes the blog post for the podcast or maybe she podcasts for the blog post i i don't know which way around it goes but i think it's an interesting um idea to have like a word for word transcript that goes along with a podcast mm -hmm. because I have had people contact me in the past and say we can't hey. understand what you're saying Jonathan Wiley yes and there's no audio <laughs> subtitles <laughs> no they've said like from an accessibility point of view um, people with hearing impairments can uh, listen to podcasts but mm -hmm. they still want the information that people are giving on a podcast so right. if they could read through like a transcript of it then mm. they still get access to the podcast mm -hmm. so look mm -hmm. into more of those accessibility options and that's yeah. that's a difficult thing for like mindy and i to do because we just talk off the cuff, cuff yeah and we just make it up as we go along and for the most part yeah sometimes it's just not very good transcribable material yeah. i don't think <laughs> cannot be transcribed <laughs> but uh yes or maybe should not be transcribed <laughs> But uh, Cult of Pedagogy is uh, a great podcast to listen to. They're a great blog as well. She doesn't podcast all her blog posts, but um, mm. if you're looking for good ideas for learning and education, that's one. And a similar vein would be the Mindshift podcast. Do you ever follow the Mindshift KQED mm. blog? Um, the blog I do, yes. Yeah. The podcast, no. Okay. So I think the, there were kind of a NPR affiliate or something. Yeah. They were related to NPR somehow. But uh, they have a really good uh, podcast, too. The podcasts are short. Um, they're like less than half an hour, like 20 minutes, 15 minutes. So if you're yeah. just looking for quick fillers to give you some ideas and inspiration on um, education and technology and all kinds of stuff, then mm -hmm. check out the Mindshift podcast, too. And I also have a uh, last recommendation here, and that is from our friends over at the Check This Out podcast. Uh, Ryan and Brian put together a crowdsourced spreadsheet of um, podcasts that educators could uh, listen to. It was kind of a, a deal where it's like, what podcast would you recommend teachers listen to? And um, so it's a spreadsheet that lists out 
all those podcasts from all kinds of different people. There's mm-hmm. how many is on that list, Mindy? Um, oh, whoa, 106. 106 different podcasts that you yep. could listen to, and the EdTech Takeout is is on that list of sh- of course, but uh, lots of other podcasts, educational and not necessarily. Were you the one that put us on here? I put us on here, yes. <laughs> I think they were they were looking I for suggestions, and I said, "Hey, I I got a great one you could add to oh, the that's list." Good stuff right there. But their podcast is on there too. So yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, Dad's and Ed is in here. Did you put that on there? I did not. Oh, good. So there's lots of good ones on there. Yeah, for sure. So if you like Arcadia, are thinking I would like some more recommendations, more things to fill up my podcast feed, then uh, take a look at this spreadsheet and uh, see what you find on there. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's all we have time for today. As always, we will have links to all the resources in our show notes for this episode, which you can access at dlgwaea.org forward slash podcast. You can send us feedback by email to podcast at gwaea.org or find us on social media. Mindy is at Team Carney. Our team account is at dlgwaea. And I am at Jonathan Wiley. Follow me on Snapchat. Didn't we do that last time? Yes. But we're doing it again. Yeah. We're just, hey, it's the same as the Twitter handle. All right. What's your Snapchat username? At mcarney10. Until next time. <laughs> this has been the EdTech Takeout. We hope it hit the spot. For more information on today's episode, please visit dlgwaea.org slash podcast. Kind of a break from the other. What? There's no ad sign, though. I shouldn't say that. It's not. There's no ad. You're sign. not at Team Carney on Snapchat. Yes. No, I'm not. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, that would have been a good idea. Oh, you should follow me around all day and just tell me those things. <laughs>